Welcome to the Emerging Biotech Leader, where we help biotech leaders maximize the value of their therapeutics from clinical development to product launch. We're your hosts. I'm Kim Kushner. And I'm Ramin Farhood. We are here to help you navigate the pitfalls of the biotech industry and illuminate the path forward. Welcome to today's episode of the Emerging Biotech Leader. Today, we're really excited to welcome our colleague, Mata Mata Gurajala, a senior vice president with SSI, who spent a lot of his career working in early biotechs, a lot of time in clinical development, and has been partnering in our collaboration with Conexa Health. In our last episode, we were welcomed by Chris Benko, their CEO, who really talked us through the digital biomarker industry and the progression of what that can really mean to the industry and the promise to patients and collaborators. Today, we're really going to be reflecting on that conversation, thinking about as an industry, are we measuring things wrong and what's inefficient about our clinical development process? What should we be thinking about to really innovate for the future? And how do we really democratize access to clinical trials and try to improve the speed of the development process overall? So welcome to the show, Mata. We're really excited to have you here. Thank you, Kim. Thank you for having me. So I do want to start on that first theme that I just called out. Um, Chris gave a really great overview of the Conexa organization, the digital biomarker space, digital measurements. It really got us reflecting, you know, as an industry, are we measuring things wrong? Are we missing the mark on the potential to measure a patient at home where we might get a more accurate read on their blood pressure or their heart rate or how many steps they're really taking in a day? Um, you know, I want to start out, Ramin Madhav, what are we missing? I think he was spot on. I think that uh, some of the things that I guess have been recorded, measured in the clinic, um, you know, are we are we incorrect in, record, in recording those measurements? No, it's just that some people have had good measurements already or they feel like that's the industry standard. Um, so maybe it's a comfort level and precedence over you know, real rules over much of uh, what the industry does. So if the regulatory agency is used to a certain measurement or uh, survey of some, some sorts, uh, they're probably going to go with that because there's precedence. Now, the question is, is it the right thing to do for the patient and, and determine whether your treatment relative to the standard of care is better or no worse? Um, so what Chris and his team at Conexa, what they're looking at is, are there measurements that already exist that could be done better. And then I also think that there's an opportunity to look at measurements that may not exist because the technology or the, the, the burden uh, of assessment for the, uh, for the measurement may not warrant um, that to be in a trial. And if that's the case, then you're going to have lack of innovation in terms of that aspect. You're going to have, you're gonna have the, uh, you know, the default to the status quo that this has already been measured. Let's go with that. Um, so I think it's more of just a, uh, an industry that's probably used to what they've been doing versus um, somebody not consciously thinking whether they, you know, they need to innovate or not. So that's where I think it, it lands. But I think what they're trying to do is they're offering things that could be disruptive. So that's what I think is, is important about what Connects is doing. And then make the industry think differently about how they're measuring for a given indication or disease state or target population. No, I fully agree, Madoff. I think they've, they've done a really great job developing evidence-based validated digital biomarker, right? That's really important that these are evidence-based and they're validated through the algorithm that they have developed. And this is just across therapeutic areas, right? They have in neuroscience, right? They have in oncology, respiratory, some other therapeutic area, alter rare diseases. They're collecting data on patients is incredibly difficult and challenging. Right, it's not like the patient can go to a clinic on a on a daily basis, or even in a clinical trial. I was reading something about the fact that ninety nine point nine percent of the time of a patient is outside of the clinic and a clinical trial. Even with a clinical trial, with multiple visits that are required, so there's a lot happening outside that right now the healthcare it's not quite ready to grab all of that information that comes in and how do you analyze it? What do you do with it? Uh, because obviously having the more complete patient picture is what everybody wants, right? And that's what we are all ever, all, all after. Yeah, I do think it's a, a really great point, Romain, because I also wonder within sponsor organizations if they really fundamentally know what to do with the amount of data that you could get 
through all of these other platforms. And, you know, I think it's almost an overwhelm of information. And sometimes you wind up with information that results in noise rather than a signal or a signal that may or may not be the signal that you want to see. And it might be additive or detrimental. So there's, I think, a complexity there that's really important. And the second piece that you brought up, Ramin, that I also want to highlight is around that analytical validation of the measurements and the biomarkers themselves. It takes a lot of time and it takes time to do it right. And connects us investing in a lot of that upfront, but for organizations to institutionalize these concepts and build this into their studies, especially for earlier stage companies where everything is a race to clinic, it becomes really challenging to balance. Do we invest the time now to validate something that could make things faster down the line? Or do we go with the well-trodden path that people understand and we can at least control how much time it's going to take, even if it's much longer than we'd like it to. Yeah. And there's a risk aversion there that comes in, right, with the clinical trial. What's tried and true that I think people would rather start with that uh, and then innovate after. So the barrier to innovation, um, you know, if these, if Connexa can, can help with that uh, and co-design some of these things earlier on, uh, would be helpful. Uh, and I think that's something that I think uh, they're, they're looking to do. Um, I also think that if there is regulatory precedence or at least some sort of dialogue with the regulatory agencies that says, yes, this might be a better way to do it, almost pre-clear some of the, uh, the measurements um, before someone adopts them in a trial, uh, I think that would help as well. So I think, again, something to work on um, that they, they may want to think about. Um, but other than that, I think the, you know, again, I've repeated, repeated myself, but I think the status quo of what's been preceded um, a, a treatment for, you know, either way through their competitors or, um, or on past trials, um, a particular sponsor company, a product company will probably default to what's tried and true. I think we're also focusing on what has really worked in the past, right? I mean, obviously this is going to be a disruptor coming to the market and, and thousands of trials actually are already using some type of a digital biomarker, but collecting data in clinical trials has historically been very linear. <clears throat> and I think that has been the challenge. Now we have the opportunity to be able to look at the data multidimensionally and pick up a lot more data from the patients. I think one of the challenges that we are also facing in this space is that we are trying to create a new community of that spans across computer science, right? Uh, bioinformatics and the healthcare. And, and these three groups have never really come together to uh, find a solution for the problem that we are talking about right now. So that in itself is also a challenge. Do you, do you guys agree? There are, there are kind of three different disciplines coming together, trying to figure out what to do. Yeah, for sure. I mean, that's where I think some of the um, focus areas within a company, if they're doing all three, tends to um, be challenging, right? Um, and if if, if the uh, if the digital aspects of it uh, also require the product companies to think about that, again, may be a little bit of a challenge because they're most they're just really thinking about um, biochemistry, right? Uh, they're thinking about some of the deep science, thinking about um, the biological aspects and mechanisms of a particular drug and treatment. Different mentality for some of the technology aspects and how the technology can actually benefit them. However, I think if you're thinking about validation, which you brought up, I mean, that kind of brings everything together, right? Um, and so the idea of the, the validation is that this thing has to measure uh, better, more frequently, better data quality um, for a given subject for a given period. And if it can do that better than the standard way of doing it, remove the bias of false positives, false negatives, you're going to have better data quality. You're going to have potential shorter trials, potentially um, fewer patients required for a given power of a trial, uh, that is that is something that I think would be appealing to the industry. And so if the sponsor companies can take an endpoint, and again, that's where I think they're measured on whether they get approval or not, they take an endpoint that exists already, they can make it better, um, and, uh, and, and that would at least allow for a faster access to the actual treatment that the sponsor companies are trying to get out there to the marketplace. Um, so again, 
uh, I think that validation piece, if we can prove that this measures it better than, let's say, the standard of, of, of measurement, um, you have something there. I do think it's an important point also on the people element of building organizations at the intersection of technology and life sciences and everything that you just described, Jermaine. We've been seeing this in you know, the digital biomarker landscape that Chris was just describing, but also more broadly in the digital therapeutic space where we're really taking tech companies and translating them into the life sciences industry to operate in the way that really a medical device company or pharma company would expect. And so they need to evolve from being really um, tech and data science focused to what is the appropriate level of intersection between these pieces and what does the new phenotype look like for companies that operate in this new world or in this new space. And we've had some opportunities to work with some really great partners and I'm working through that, but it's a lot of education on both sides. I think industry needs to learn a lot about data science and learn a lot about the value and the promise of these technologies. But the tech sector also needs to learn a lot about life sciences and learn a lot about the regulated device or regulated pharmaceutical space and what does it mean to operate under FDA or EMA guidance? And what does it mean to need to build an evidence base for payers to want to come to the table? We have a lot of different stakeholders that I think are incredibly new for that sector. And so that intersection, I think, from a people element is a re really unique um, construct that a lot of organizations are working through. Think about it. You're bringing technology and pharmaceutical completely to different cultures, to different two different industries, they could not be more different together to find a solution. And, and I think that's that's probably one of the core of challenges. But at the same time, it's, it's really exciting, right? Because you are bringing people together with different expertise in the same room, looking to solve a problem that both the healthcare and the, and the uh, technology together can definitely accelerate and give us a more accurate and, and better picture of what's happening with the, with the patient. And I think that's, that's the intersections that we are talking about. Along those lines, I, I do wanna shift gears a little bit to talk about the clinical development process overall. Chris talked about this a little bit, and I know we've talked about this as an organization quite a bit, that the clinical development process really needs to start with bringing forward or backwards, kind of depending on how you think about it, but really have the end in mind in your development process, thinking about the ultimate stakeholders who are going to leverage the data and the evidence that you're generating throughout your multiple phases. Find ways to shorten these phases as, as much as possible. In some circumstances, skip phases if potentially possible. It doesn't have to be as clear and linear of a path if we're really creative upfront, but we haven't seen the industry widely institutionalize this concept of really using that end in mind in their early, earliest development. We'll love your perspectives on why not and what are the barriers to really starting to do that more widely. Yeah, I mean, I think some of the innovative modalities and mechanisms of actions that you're seeing, genetic medicines, ATMPs on the European side, I think some of that is bringing an accelerated approval path, or I think they're also bringing um, in the need for um, not only whether the drug is safe and efficacious, which gets you the right to sell the drug, the approval from the authorities, but I think that the, the payers and the insurance companies and those who are responsible for reimbursement, uh, I think they're going to want to know that this thing works either better than standard care or at least is good and does no harm. And so when you think about, again, whether you can sell the drug and whether you can get paid for the drug, um, that is the engine that takes all the research and brings it forward, right? That's the economic engine. Um, the more the companies think about that in the beginning, the earlier it is to design it in the process, take an endpoint from exploratory, go to secondary, go to primary, and then demonstrate that to the authorities as well as the payers. I think some, some companies are thinking about that. They're getting better at that. Not enough, Kim. Uh, and I think it's because of just, again, what's the immediate immediacy? Uh, that immediacy thinking um, is probably preventing them from thinking beyond that. But then also, there could be a cost aspect. And if it's a cost aspect, 
you know, could some, again, I, I bring it back to Conexa and, and their potential way to disrupt this. If they can do more measurement for a given subject for a given period of time, and those trials can be done much easier, whether it's at home and decentralized or uh, in the clinic and or, or both, um, if you can get better data, then perhaps that barrier to entry in adopting that um, you know, could be minimized. And so we don't know for a fact whether it's one or the other, but I do feel like there's multiple factors there. And one of the factors could be the fact that it can be expensive to get all those things in in the first phase one, phase two, phase uh, you know, through phase three. So if it is an expense issue, I think this is something where um, where it connects with value proposition comes in. I do think a lot of companies are getting a lot better. Uh, we are today that maybe even five, 10, 15 years ago, for sure. And that early involvement that you bring up, Kim, with regards, do we need to think about early what the end is going to look like, right? And even if you think about, and it's not just about what, what the molecule is going to look like, but also the voice of the patients early, right? The voice of the payer early, listening to the community and the, and the thought leaders and the clinician early as you're designing to see what it is that you want to focus on. Does this even make sense early on? I think more and more companies are starting to think that way. But I still believe that we have a long way to go for all the reasons Madoff just, just brought up. We have a way of thinking that drug development is very sequential and a linear path. And the reality, and yes, it does look that way, but the reality is that it has many built-in feedback mechanism, right? And all the different stakeholders from the translational medicinal discovery all the way to access, approval, access, commercial they all need to work together in a very united way at the very early on in order to have that successful drug coming to the market and the patient having access to it. And I think that's a piece that we are getting better at it uh, in our industry, but still have, have a long way to go uh, to maximize that output. There's this interesting trend in oncology is a great space to look at it. I mean, there's the linear path of the early development process, but there's also so many opportunities for real world evidence and creative sources of data that are out there. There's a lot of organizations that are building synthetic control arms and using claims data early on to provide signals of which patient populations might actually benefit more or less or might have um, a lesser treatment effect or side effects or other things that we're actively trying to monitor against. And, Technology is a really incredible enabler for us to be able to model some of these things proactively. So our development process itself can get a lot smarter. So there's the Conexa piece about measuring and can we measure things smarter and can we get more data from patients in a more real world, real time setting so that your, your evidence package is more meaningful and hopefully faster. But then there's also other forms of technology or opportunities that we can um, fold into our development process that can make us more informed in our decision-making overall. And I think all of those things are huge opportunities for the development process itself to really be overhauled in the coming years. No, I fully agree. I, I really think that the digital biomarker needs to be part of the drug development strategy and not just looking at a piece that you bring in on your phase three and say, this is, this is the digital biomarker, whether it's a variable or a smart form, whatever the case may be, and this is how we collect the data. I don't think you will realize the full potential and benefit of digital biomarker, right? If you're looking at it in a very transactional way, as opposed to what is our digital biomarker strategy for our drug development program for that particular therapeutic area? I think that's where you maximize the benefit. Um, I do have a question for, for both of you. So where do you think the future is? Where are we going with this? We talked to Chris a little about in the next five, eight years, by end of this decade, where do you think we will be? Well, before we answer that, I mean, do you mind if I just have one more comment on the biomarker, digital biomarker? So I think it's important. I think it's one of the tools in the toolbox for measurement, um, for a given indication, for a, a treatment. Um, it needs to be tied to eventually the clinical outcome. So that measurement to tie to the clinical outcome is going to be important. So even if you have a digital biomarker measuring things, just make sure it's measuring the right things. So one thing that I thought was interesting is talking about prodromal um, measurements where you're almost predicting 
uh, him correlating a particular symptom with predicting an outcome. If that's the case, I mean, I think that's, again, the sooner you realize um, that this could happen and manifest, and if you can make it um, highly correlated, um, that could be an equivalent to a even a, a biomarker that's you know, a lab, lab uh, uh, draw or, or a, um, a ECG of some sort. So uh, the traditional biomarkers, um, it, this could be equivalent to a traditional biomarker and making sure that is one piece of the evidence generation story um, for a given treatment. So I just want to go back there and say that the, the tie into the clinical outcome is important as well. And then in terms of your question, I mean, for the potential in the future, to me, I think there's so much promise to completely democratize access to clinical trials. There are millions of potential patients that don't get access to trials, whether it's that they can't get to clinics for all of the appointments, whether they don't know about the potential of trials. There's there's so many different variables that keep people away. And unfortunately, a lot of distrust of the industry, all of these different factors. But I see digital measurement and digital biomarkers being the mechanism to bring more people into the fold so that we can help more patients and do so faster to get more treatments in the hands of people who need them and are going to benefit them overall. So to me, it's a really lofty vision, but I think we're finally at the point to your earlier comments, I mean, where we can actually use things that are so native to people's daily lives that it is going to be, I think, very obvious for people to participate where in the past there have been a hundred different barriers to involvement. You know, tech in general has always been a democratization of, of access to things. and. This thing is healthcare, and so if it happens in the clinical trials, excellent. Um, and just to emphasize one of your points um, that Chris mentioned, you know, having some of the pediatric indications where the kids traveling to a clinic, um, there is uh, an issue sometimes in having that happen. There's there's potential bias in the measurement; they may not be in the right mood, etc. I mean, I've I think there's been real serious issues and SAEs uh, in the travel aspect. So if this can help prevent some of that, and this could help measure better in the pediatric indications, um, you could see some ultra rare, rare diseases, genetic medicines that may come about sooner than um, having some of these SAEs and having, address, and having to address some of these SAEs because of logistics. So the decentralized aspect um, goes hand in hand with the democratization you mentioned, Kim, and then I think if you extend this out beyond the clinical trials, um, think about right now, we're wearing wearables and getting measured all the time. Uh, and there's a level of sophistication there. For the clinical trials, the validation required is a higher level of sophistication. But imagine now pushing that down to the general population, and then we're taking a wearable here, another wearable there, and then this platform aggregates it at some point. Again, just thinking, putting my future hat on. Um, imagine us being proactive and monitoring in a level of sophistication we've never done before about our own health and we're proactively demanding certain healthcare here and there versus somebody prescribing it to us. So again, just something out there, uh, a little bit further on out there, but I do imagine this is uh, the trend. No, I agree with both of you. I think this is really exciting, um, especially for the patients, because ultimately I think the different disciplines will come together, they find a solution uh, and the, the ultimate winner in this whole thing, I really think are gonna be the patients they'll get better care uh, and their physicians, whether they're in a clinical trial or just outside of a clinical trial, the physician and the healthcare system will have a lot more access to what's happening actually with that patient instead of just visiting them for 10 minutes or 20 minutes or whatever that, whatever that time is. So I think this, this, to me, the digital biomarkers are one of the most patient-centric, patient-focused tools that can help us to advance advance the sire and science and better understanding of how our therapies are working. And even as Chris mentioned yesterday about natural history, about some of these ultra rare diseases, especially neurological conditions, there's no natural history data even available. Uh, and I think that that will also be very helpful to collect information from there as well. I think there's incredible promise to everything that Conexa is building and very excited to be you know, a small part of their own trajectory as, as well as, you know, part of the transformation of this industry as a whole. 
Madhav, really appreciate you joining us today and, and talking through your perspectives here. It's great, Kevin. I mean, thank you for the forum. Appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you, Madhav. Thanks for tuning in to the Emerging Biotech Leader, an SSI strategy podcast. Join us each month for more conversations with biotech leaders. If you'd like to help navigating the complexities of biotech, reach out to our team at SSIStrategy.com. Don't forget to hit subscribe and leave a review. Thank you.